Tim, thank you to our three, three previous speakers who are now asked to stand up. And please join the panel. Um, and I want to thank Igor, who is now, Igor Campilla is going to chair the panel for us. He already did a wonderful job uh, introducing the panel for us. And I pass over the microphone to, to you or, yes. Thank you. Do you want me to hold the time for you in any way? Oh, uh, yes. I think we Shall have I say, 45 minutes. Yeah. Should I give you... When I flash, it's yeah. the first 15. Okay. When I flash two hands, it's the second it's half an hour. Okay. But please look at Thank. this because certain people don't. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Olivia. Wow. So we are reaching the end. And uh, it is, for me, a huge responsibility to share this uh, last panel session of the day and last panel discussion, not only of the day, but also of the final conference. So, wow, <laughs> I am a bit nervous about this. So thank you very much. It is an honor for me to do this, to do this job. And not only because of the time, but also because of the people that are that are involved in this in this panel, so we have have the privilege to uh, listen to them in these uh, four inspiring talks. So I want to thank you all, Chris, Paola, Gary, Tim, for your uh, presentations. And well, here we are reaching the end. And the idea of this panel is to have uh, this uh, discussion about the future of universities, to share perspectives, to share thoughts, to share concerns, to share even fears about the future that we have in front of us. And we have to keep in mind that uh, we are dealing with institutions that more or less they are uh, a thousand years old, more or less. So uh, we are not doing or we are not trying to do uh, an exercise of predicting the future, because it is a futile activity to do a prediction. Okay, what we want to do is a collective exercise, a collective discussion to envision a desirable future for the universities. And here, it is important to keep in mind the time frame. We are not talking about the next 1,000 years. We are talking about a time frame as team was suggesting at the end of uh, his talk, well, the time frame of the next generation, the next two generation, at least a time frame in which we can intervene, okay? Because that future of universities that we are envisioning, it is something that we have to build. So we have a responsibility for that future of universities. So the idea is to keep an eye in the time frame of uh, or, or a time frame in which we can do something to build this uh, future of universities. And of course, having, I would say, these thought leaders uh, that we have uh, here, I think this exercise will be, you know, something that I am sure that will provide insights and that uh, will uh, give us uh, strength to face and to tackle the challenge of creating the, the, the universities of the future. So I just want to recall that uh, this discussion about the future of universities has been, I think, a revolving topic within Intrepid, at least during the last two years. I think the first uh, workshop that, uh, in which uh, the discussion started was in the uh, London uh, meeting in March 2017, in which uh, several questions were asked and raised and discussed between a group of people. And after this uh, workshop, then there were another uh, workshop in the context of the TD uh, conference uh, held in, in Leufana University in, in Germany in September that same year. After that, as uh, Marite said this morning, there was a uh, training school in Barcelona last year, in which, in this case, it wasn't uh, a sort of conceptual workshop. It was a training a school, a training workshop in order to, well, to explore concepts and practices that could help us 
build that future of universities. Then uh, in September last year, we have uh, the Donostia or San Sebastian summer school in the Basque Country, in which we were you know, discussing about several factors that could shape the future of universities. Then in January uh, this year, as uh, it was uh, shown uh, in the morning, we had uh, another workshop. In this case, it was much more focused on the place and space of knowledge, something that it is crucial for the future of universities. And we had these uh, lovely panels that uh, the non-architecture uh, group, uh, well, put there and, uh, and that are here also. And then we have the Rome meeting as well. So if we look back to these last two years, we can see that we have had a long journey that started in London, that went to Lunenburg, Barcelona, Donostia, Newcastle, Rome, and finally here in Lisbon. Well, so we have reached the end. And for, I mean, the, the best way of ending this intrepid journey is with a panel discussion about the future of universities with these uh, four people. The idea now is that, uh, well, we have listened to them, we have uh, had many insights and ideas, and uh, I anticipated some questions, okay, in such a way that uh, could prepare. So now I realize that, <laughs> I mean, how, ca how could I do that, uh, keeping in mind the presentation that they have just done? So, but in any case, I would like to uh, propose those questions because the idea is that after the interventions, we will have an open discussion. So everybody could, well, raise a question or uh, introduce a comment or whichever you wish about this topic of the future of universities. So let me just uh, show the different questions that are part of the panel and that uh, somehow in the background of this discussion, uh, we have the questions that were at the very beginning raised in London. Okay, so we have been revolving around those questions with, you know, different formats, with different formulations, but essentially the questions there are the questions uh, that we have to uh, uh, ask and answer in order to envision the future of universities. But in any case, I have just reformulated some of the questions with the only intention to ignite the discussion. This is not about delivering a presentation, it is just a question of ignite a discussion. So we will start with, I will just put all the questions in such a way that then the panelists, they can, in five minutes, they can speak about how they envision the future of universities, maybe answering to one of those questions, maybe adding something to their former presentations. So please feel free because now I think we must be relaxed in order to end up, you know, in the, in the, in the best way. So the first question is a, a general question. Um, this quotation by Albert Einstein has been uh, mentioned, I think, several times during this uh, conference. And, uh, well, it is clear that we cannot solve problems at the same level of thinking and consciousness that created them. So the question could be, which are the current underlying higher education community perceptions, that is the narratives and belief systems that are preventing universities from delivering the kind of leadership needed to create sustainable futures? This is one of the questions. Then we can move to a different set of questions. In this case, we can look at universities through the lens of global megatrends. And some of the presentations and the, and the messages that we have heard before are very much related to, this, to these questions. So for example, which role do we envision for universities in an increasing interconnected globe with two contradictory tendencies? One of breaking down the geographical barriers enabled by technology, as Paula said, but at the same time, another tendency of rising local identities and even establishing walls, as we know. 
how do you imagine universities in a world of, as Paola said, virtual, augmented, or mixed realities? How will universities change their curricula as well the way they teach in this high-tech scenario? Or what will learning and employability mean for universities in a world dominated by artificial intelligence? Or finally, what changes must universities introduce in order to respond to population with increased lifespans and longer and at the same time fast changing careers? So these are questions related to several mega trends that we have in front of us. Then there is another question. Sorry. Then uh, we can move to a, I would say, uh, a more uh, current and common situation. Because when we are talking about uh, the university, in fact, we are talking about, or we are evoking, many types of institutions that are subject to contradictory tendencies. One tendency encourages global competition and rankings. And the other tendency promotes greater cooperation between colleges and universities and between them and other actors in knowledge and innovation ecosystems. So the question will be how can or how should we upgrade the higher education institutional operating system in order to break down this high energy demanding struggle to scale up in rankings which respond to a self-centered academic logic and be more connected to societal challenges and needs. And finally, and I want to end up with this question to open the discussion, finally, in the last session this morning, we have listened to some insights of this uh, the place and space of knowledge. So there is a last question that I want to ask to you or to ignite the discussion. Why do you think that we still need physical universities in the future? Because I think that we need physical universities in the future, despite you know, the advent of this accelerating technology. This is not a belief, but a conviction. But my question is, why do you think that we will still need physical universities in the future, which is something also very much related to this morning, this last uh, morning uh, talk in the framework of the last workshop in Newcastle. So these are the questions. The floor is yours. Please take some minutes to talk about them or to complete your previous presentations. And then after that, we will open the discussion to any of you that can contribute to this discussion. So thank you very much. So I mean, just to follow the, the order and you have been, you have sit in the same order in which uh, you have doing the presentation. So we will start with, okay. So we will do the other way around. Tim, we'll start then Gary, Paola and just, Chris. Just, just a few extra words thank on, you. The, on, on uh, Igor's first question. What's driving universities against what we're looking for? And there are three reasons. You need to be aware of it. One is this global ranking, global reputation around a carefully constructed, self-recreating, reinforcing knowledge system, which I think Garen will say more about. The more the economy, the more society, the more the military establishment, the more the AI people and so on want things to happen, the more universities feel compelled to teach their, chil their children, their pupils or their you know, students in a certain way. That is a serious constraining drive. Two, the universities are desperately in need of income. And one of the problems we face now is, is, is a debate about whether students should be paying fees or not is a great demand to keep the students happy. And three, and the most important thing is that the faculty themselves are browbeaten to stay in the disciplines because they, get, they go into an interdisciplinary long-term slightly what you might call vague research it takes time to do well and is quite demanding from the point of view of achievement and success and output then the deans of faculty say what have you been doing for the last three years i don't see any publications you've got two more years left otherwise the guillotine will come down and that frightens faculty like nobody's business what you do about this first of all enough very quick change the ranking structure so what they're after is what is ranked high that's number one. They won't, universities like ranking and they'll always do it. 
to change the ranking structure and the incentive structure, to get the students to tell the universities what they're looking for, get the, the employers to tell universities what they think is a good employee in this age of change, and finally get civil society to say, that's what we're prepared to fund universities for. We want a, a society in the future that will help us grow old in dignity and they can still exist and do something worthwhile that, in a world that we can't bequeath any longer in the way we're doing it. That's, if we do that, the university will have to change their tune. In 2013, we conducted a meeting with the United Nations in Geneva for a few hundred diplomats. And we looked at different parts of the global challenge. And we asked a question, if you were going to create a system of global education to deliver world-class quality education to everybody who wants it, how would you do it? Nobody had an answer, there was dead silence. But everybody agreed, you wouldn't do what we're doing now. You would not, what we're doing now is each university trying to survive in a very challenging, fast-growing situation where they're competing with one another. For the, the, the goal is the survival of the university, not the delivery of the best quality and relevant education to everybody. So we got together a group of NGOs who felt strongly about this and created a new organization called the World University Consortium to ask that question for ourselves. And we've been working on it for the last six years. One of the things, hopes we had at the beginning was, well, with the online revolution, we can have the best quality knowledge and the best communicators and inspired teachers and make them available at low cost to everybody in the world. And it sounded really good on paper. And we had our first meeting at UC Berkeley. I wanted to go back to my alma mater and tell them that there's a solution for them. But the more we looked into it, the more I realized, as Igor said, that that's not so simple. That the learning process is not just a, if we want to disseminate information, the online is a wonderful tool for that, and good communicators with the great graphics and all the stuff. But learning is not just a, a question of piping out information. It's a human relation, it's a question of human relationships. It's a question of interaction. It's a question of hearing views that are opposite to your own and trying to reconcile a multiplicity of perspectives. And for that, I don't see any way to eliminate the first-hand personal human interaction which we're trying to have today. And the less structured it is, in many sense, maybe the most effective. So coming to one of the many questions you asked, I think whether the university is going to look at all like it is today, a very wise man said to me 40 years ago, we should close all the great universities and I was outraged by how can we close them? These are our models and everything. And now I see the wisdom of what he said, because I find wherever we go in the world, everybody's trying to become like that. When we know that's not what we need, we know that's not a solution to our, uh, pro they may survive, the Oxbridges and uh, Harvard and MITs may survive, but other organizations cannot, and even if they succeeded in becoming like that, it won't meet our needs. We need new models. We got to get out of the box. We've got to let learning out of the box. And one of the things I think we need to do is get certification. Separate, you talked about rankings, and I agree with you, but we get certification out of the, if you separate certification from the university, and you create an independent certify, and all these universities are certified by somebody else, you know. Uh, uh, if you get it out, then you get people to choose where they want to go for their knowledge, and they'll be judged not by where they go, but they'll be judged by what they know. Uh, and when you talk to companies like Google or any of the big <coughs> companies about what they want, they'll tell you for sure that the mark, the scores and grades and everything that uh, students are getting in the universities is not what we look for. We're looking for people who know not doesn't have the right answer because in most cases there is no right answer. We're being taught for so many years to give a right answer as if reality and truth is so simple. 
but in, uh, in reality, we're faced with new situations where we have to learn how to discover new, think out of the box, solve problems, be creative about it. And our educational system may be the finest, do it in a little way, but we're still programming uh, people to, to get that knowledge and get it on a, a test uh, so that we can uh, perform. Uh, and there are models about getting out of the box. Um, I had a small business, vocational business college in South India training postgraduates for uh, work in the logistics and supply chain management, pretty mechanical thing. And when you see what they're doing, uh, the curriculum is developed by the government and industry, but they're simply memorizing a, a textbook. Uh, and we decided to throw away the textbook and try to relate them to what's going on in the society. And the result was they're learning in a few weeks what they were learning in a year. And the companies are coming and saying, this is what we want, not that. And the students are asking their friends to come. And they don't want to leave because we're teaching them something in the context of the society they know. So I, I, uh, I think there are models out there, like at Cole 42 in Paris, where 3,000 students, seven faculty members, no teaching. It's all peer-to-peer self-learning. And now there are 12 of them in different countries, and they're coming up because the, the quality of the learning is better. So I think you're asking great questions. Um, I totally agree, and I will answer the easiest question first. Uh, yes, we will need physical universities in the future too, too. And I believe physical universities will prevail over digital universities. Maybe they will go online too, but they have values and traditions that will stay. And we need physically, we will need physical universities because at the end of the day, we need to meet with people. We can work or study remotely. And I don't say this because, just because I believe in it, but because I experienced it. Uh, I worked for communication agencies uh, that are based all over the world. And I worked with people I've never met before. And it works very well. You can use the great digital platforms like Slack or Zoom or the ones I mentioned before. And that's OK. But once or twice a year or more often, you need to meet with people and have a coffee together and know them and, and watch them in their eyes. You know, it's absolutely needed. And when it comes to studying and to, to knowledge and to learning, I think it must be part of the process. Then the second thing I wanted to say is that I, I've always believed in learning by example. So I believe that academies, institutions, universities can give an example of uh, not globalizing, it's, a, the, it's not the correct term, but of uh, uh, creating a global education, which does not mean erasing the differences. It means giving the possibility to people to work together to collaborate. This must emphasize the differences, the, the possibilities of contamination, not not uh, eliminate, not, not uh, eradicate them, absolutely not. But this would be a great example, thinking out of the box, creating new models and so on, but it will be not enough to change the future. We were discussing this with Tim in the, during the, the coffee break. The, what can change the future is maybe the collaboration of university with policy makers, but what will change the future are the policies. Technology is not in itself, I was talking about technology, so that, that's my uh, area, but it's not technology that is endangering our future or giving us uh, a, a, a dystopian, um, uh, dystopian alternatives for the future. It's politics. It's policies. The description of Yuval Noah Harari when he says we will have huge social inequities will be true in a few years if policies do not intervene. The problem with politics today is that most politicians, and that is really glo globalized all over the world, uh, either don't understand what is happening, and I'll give you a very, uh, just a very funny example of, of this. Did you see, did someone of you see the auditions at the Senate uh, uh, of Mark Zuckerberg back last year? There were 
just a couple of senators who knew what they were talking about, and they were talking about a social network, not particularly uh, difficult to understand artificial intelligences. No one was knowing, knew what they were talking about. So Mark Zuckerberg basically could say anything he wanted because they didn't, they didn't know. They were absolutely in the dark. That's the, this doesn't help because no good policy ever comes from someone that does not understand what he's talking about. And in the worst case, maybe they understand what they're talking about, but then they're, they're just not interested because they are not interested in tackling the problem of uh, uh, social inequities in, uh, in the end. So, uh, but there uh, are the answers and maybe universities can push uh, a, a global thinking in these terms can push to the correct answers, uh, enabling more knowledge, more awareness in the people, in the students, in the population, in gen more general and more broad terms, and pushing and lobbying the politicians to go in the right direction. There are a lot of economic theories that are interesting in these terms. Uh, universal basic income in, in, that goes with automation and, and so on. They are just not really seriously considered by any state right now. So I, I think you should work on that. Thank you. I think we have to create or, or contribute to the creation of a new narrative of what the university is and, and what, what higher education um, can mean. And um, one of the, the hopeful um, key words and, and ideas is that things diversify. So we need to um, provide options of alternatives of how learning can be redefined or maybe rediscovered in a way. And to me, it is to do with how our life and many changes keep accelerating. So this process of accelerating change, which also relates to the digital age and how maybe in our lifetime and the lifetime of the next generation, jobs and what we do actually might change once or twice or maybe even uh, more frequent. And that we rethink this in a way of lifelong learning or unending education we might need to join higher education to relearn things and to unlearn things. And this would redefine the university as such as a place of where people congregate. And um, that brings me also to this point of locality. So there is this notion of creating learning villages and learning communities. And what I mentioned earlier, this issue of immersion, to learn from praxis examples. How can things change? How can we learn from this? How can we contribute to this as communities, collaboratively? Um, and this would actually question the whole current system, the system of certification, the system of ranking and grading. I don't want to repeat all this, but I totally agree that we need to probably enhance the power of what the niche can contribute in terms of transitioning to a different and maybe more uh, relevant educational system. Maybe a system of learning, of continuous learning. I, I like this more than education, actually. Education relates more to the formal aspects. How are we doing things? How do we organize it? There is a system around this. So rethinking and recreating the system. And um, in fact, we have still, even though there is a sort of homogenization going on globally maybe, but there are different um, systems of higher education in place. I've been working in, in Germany at German universities. Uh, currently, I'm in the UK and already these two systems are quite different. Um, in terms of the market orientation of UK universities, um, the tuition fees that are charged there. And um, uh, I've been working also in, in India, um, as I mentioned earlier. And there it is a highly centralized system, but there is such a pressure to educate young people that private universities are popping up everywhere across the country and there is 
basically no quality control. They are just designed as a business and people send their kids there um, to create engineers, but they are not fit for purpose. They are being retrained by other smaller consultants and companies so that these seemingly engineers can become you know, useful for the market. So in, in emerging countries, in developing countries, there is a different pressure of creating an upward mobility and secure your life. And we need to think about what this might mean actually for the um, educational sector and also with the ambitions that we have of creating new universities. Um, there is an example, and this is just before I conclude now, where in, in Rajasthan they have created a university or a place of higher learning where the students actually design their own curriculum. They don't need to have a degree, they also don't get a degree, and um, they choose a mentor and then they start a one or two year long learning journey. It is a bit uh, a reminder, I think, of what you just said about your own um, path of, of learning. And that is, I think, um, something that is really interesting and hopeful. Thank you. So thank you for your interventions. I think, well, you have uh, raised uh, very powerful ideas and uh, insights. I, I do agree that uh, the, there is a problem with the accreditation. There is a problem because, uh, as uh, Gary said, uh, somehow universities, they have the monopoly of the degrees right now. So this is a, a problem and this is something that could change in the future. I don't know how, I don't know when, but that could be the case because uh, if we think in terms of knowledge, universities used to have the monopoly of knowledge, but this is not the case since many decades. So in the same way, uh, universities could lose the monopoly of the degrees. And this can be enabled by technology, blockchain, and all these things. I don't know exactly how, but I think this could have an impact in, in the way in which uh, we are uh, accredited. So, um, and there is also a tension between, I think, uh, let's say, standardization and personalization. Okay, so I think uh, universities must be much more flexible, much more, I mean, liquid, in such a way that they can enable to enable students to set up their own curricula. There are cases of, of that uh, ongoing right now. But I think here there is a tension that, uh, and from tensions and from, you know, thesis and an antithesis, something can, can emerge. But in any case, I would like to open uh, the discussion to, to all of you. So please feel free to add any comment or maybe to raise any other question that it is not there because of course maybe there are uh, other questions in thinking about the future of universities. So please feel free to comment, feel free to ask to the speakers in, in the panel. And thank you for your inspiring uh, lectures and presentations and I have basically one question. Um, why do you think that young people students or potential students would choose to study at a university in the future? Um, I think that should be the question. To turn it around, not how we, should we change. Why do you think young people will choose to study at a university at all in the future? It will be less and less common in future because knowledge is available everywhere and if we do that one thing about the accreditation, I think it'll be much, much more common that students seek the experience they want, the knowledge they want, rather than go through this, the traditional formal process. Uh, Stanford University did a study about uh, five years ago talking about the university in 2025, their own university. And the consensus within the university was that by 2025, 
people will not be taking majors in departments. The departments will be resources, and each student will be mapping out what they want and, and going to departments and shopping for the, what they're interested in. And instead of getting everybody coming out with the same standardized education, each will be getting a customized education according to what they want. Well, if you take the certification out of the university and you make it universal, then it's not just the university department, it's the universities, it's the country, it's, the, it's everything. And I think that's inevitable because if the universities don't do it, why the students would seek, of course, the obvious reason they seek it today is because they want employment. So if, if the companies start getting together, if you get the Googles and Amazons and Facebooks and a whole other saying, this is the certification that we will accept universally, you'll go a long way to breaking down the, the barriers. Well, just very quickly, the conventional wisdom, and I'm sure you know this, is that students go to university because they think, A, they can get employed, and B, they can get a higher income. But actually, what's interesting is that recent work has shown that the level of employment for students is lower and it is dropping, and the income differential between a graduate and a non-graduate is narrowing. So actually, the incentive for a student to go to university is now becoming less noticeable, particularly with university fees. So that's the reason why Intrepid should be making the argument, which we've been making all afternoon, there are roles for the university, but they're not the conventional roles. They are actually a losing game for students and for universities. What we're talking about is the beginning of a new winning game. And that, that message really has to be got across, because it's a, it's a, it's, it is a zero-sum loss to a university to carry on with the same generation. And that's why a lot of you were talking earlier about understanding power, empathy, new ways of social communication, leadership in a great variety of ways. Those are skills universities can teach in a variety of ways, not in four walls. And the, then the student becomes a valuable asset for the community and indeed for him or herself later on. You, you, Intrepid's got the right stuff. You just need to articulate it really well. Do you want to add something? No. I just want to say something about this because I think there is also a tension between standardization and personalization, but I think there will be a tension between employability and learnability. And I think learnability versus employability. And I think uh, probably the, the, the role of universities or the future of universities is more in the learnability than in the employability, and this is very much related to what Paola said about the for the sake of education, that I really like that expression. So uh, I just want to make a comment because I didn't see this issue there and in the, in, in, among the questions, and it was only touched a few times uh, during the presentation. I think that if we're thinking to, uh, about a better university, a future university, I think we should take into account that we have huge structural obstacles on the way. And I'm thinking especially to, uh, to this about the system of incentives that we have, the ranking was mentioned, the, the funds, uh, the financing system, the, the projectification of research, uh, all these artificial competition that we establish and introduce in our line of work because we have to evaluate something that, it, that is really difficult to evaluate. Who is the, the, the best scholar? So we invent citation system, etc., etc. And there is uh, the, these, uh, these very short cycles of intellectual fashion, so buzzwords are associated to calls, etc., uh, etc. Et Even to win a cost, you have to, to use some buzzword, right? And the bureaucratization, the precarization of, uh, of uh, academic life uh, in terms of jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I think this is making, since we're talking about ourselves and our inner world and well-being, et cetera, et cetera, I think that it's pretty clear nowadays that this is making our life miserable. If you ask around probably 99% of your colleagues would say that they have typically too much stuff to do, they're late on their deadlines, uh, they, 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 they are stressed, they're, they're unable to refuse further assignments, further tasks, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and they reset 
you know, their activity at every project, every contract, et cetera, et cetera. I think that this is the central question if we're thinking about the, the, the uh, say, uh, saying something about the mission of the university. And the university is not saying uh, so, so much about this very crucial topic. And I think this is also something that weakens the position of the university. In the last uh, two decades, the Italian university was, was invested by huge cuts and was completely silent as a whole in terms of what the mission of a university would be in the future and why university is needed and should be funded with public money, for example. So I think this is a central question. Um, my name is Filippa. I'm not a member um, of anything. I don't have a PhD <laughs> either <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, but I've been working a lot with young people in informal, inf informal education, especially in the museum context, but not only. Um, I know pretty well the case of the UK where I used to work and there has been an increasing number of um, alternative universities or schools, as you know probably. Um, I've been looking mostly to the art scene, but not only in the art scene, there's also other universities. So these young people I've been working with, they're not interested in certificates, they're not interested in accreditation, in employment really as such. Um, or in skills, you know what you tell, tell them uh, about skills, and they're, they're interested in doing what they like and doing how they like it and with whom they would like to do it. Um, so they form their own universities and they invite people who are inspiring to them um, to give them what they want to do and to collaborate. Now, there's this a pattern among all these schools. Uh, they're mostly based in friendship and trust, and they're mostly free. Um, obviously, with the UK rising fees, most of these students don't see the point of paying so much to go to university. So my question in the end is, um, has anyone been looking at these cases, uh, and how do you think they might be helpful to understand where the university can be, um, and do you think there can be at some point a more formal relationship with informal education? Um, do you think there can be a relationship between higher institutions and alternative uh, universities? Uh, what, what we all can benefit from that. Briefly, I think that uh, what you're describing is wonderful and really healthy and inevitable, uh, that education is getting out of the box. It's, n it's not that we're going to look at one formula, it's going to go from this to something else, it's going to go in many directions. We're still going to have people who are rushing to universities because they want a job and because they want an income. I think it's very healthy that we get money more of these informal communities and I suspect that the real creativity will come outside the formal structure more than it will come inside where there's such a need to try to survive and justify the way they are. But it's really great news. You know, if you look historically, uh, the real learning communities were small city-states, like in Athens, like in Renaissance Italy or in Germany. The small community where people learn from the interaction with others and the experience. The city has been a university long before we had universities uh, as we do today. Uh, and now that the, the knowledge is out of the box, many different types of informal or different types of form, uh, I think, are, are inevitable and really natural. When will the monolithic organizations <laughs> respond to that by opening their gates and their doors? That's another question. But this is a very healthy, uh, healthy piece. Yeah, just briefly, probably to um, support this, that's um, relating to what I said in the beginning, that we need to create these alternative pathways and these uh, uh, alternative stories to tell that there are other options. I see basically only two ways of creating something new or novel. One is this kind of grassroots, bottom-up, um, pop-up, 
universities, small places of creative people who see a purpose in this. And the other option is when we talk about these monolithic systems, that there is some sort of enlightened leadership. <laughs> um, otherwise, it is very hard to um, uh, uh, change um, century old structures or at least 100, 150 year old structures as the modern universities are, are, are rooted in the 19th century formalization. We also probably, um, it is healthy to have a look at these historical developments because this was the time when education was made mandatory in Europe and that also contributed to the formalization and to the standardization. So maybe it is time to move away from this again and to create diversity again. Collège de France is an institution with uh, many century years experience just to share knowledge. And to share knowledge not only in a beautiful place, which is where everyone wants to go, and which is also connect through web to everybody who wants to uh, have profit from this excellence because most of the people who are going to Collège de France to give conference are very well-known people. So this is just about place. And all place is very important if the city and if the place in the city could connect people and if it's possible also to connect through the web. The second example also in France, altogether I have just three examples. So the second one is about a, a new way of uh, learning and it's more a program than a university. It's in Lyon and for the master program, they just decide not to be in a specific place. But in a place where there is some needs from the city. And so they just invite people to share knowledge for students according to the real problem of the life in a place. And it's, for instance, um, before it could be old mills or industrial place and so on. So it just ought to use local resources in order to propose new things with the civil society. And the third example is in China. As I work a lot in China, I have a lot of influence from China. And it's with a very well-known uh, Chinese architect now, Pritzker Prize, called Wang Shu. And because there is so many difficulties for rural territories just to have link with uh, cities and with uh, access to sanitary service, economic uh, opportunities, learning opportunities, and there is also a lot of research for people from city to learn from rural people. It's to have this uh, very new sort of program in rural places, not always in the same place, and just to have the link between different generations. So my reflection is uh, just this comment about place, about learning, and about how to link local and global possibility. So according to my own point of view, it's important just to have in mind what is the context, what is the resource. Uh, we, we have examples of that, uh, how things are changing. One example is 
the presentation by value creators. But in, in, it is happening now, but students are no longer passive consumers of education. And in the future, the university must provide or enable the conditions in such a way that the students are more active actors of their own education. So the future of the university must be in that direction, which connects very much with different uh, agents in the territories in which they are based in. So I think we have to keep in mind this to move from passive consumers to active agents of their own education and university must enable us that possibility for the future, maybe. Yeah, uh, no, it just uh, some of your talks re remind me of some experience I had recently in a, I had a chance to, to watch some movies that were about uh, directed by Brazilian indigenous people, not about them, but directed by them and also about them. So it's, it's like what uh, their humanity and the way they live in the planet is what we forgot about. You know? So maybe we should uh, hire some indigenous people to teach us soft skills, <laughs> you know, like those skills you, you do, because it's really, uh, it's all there. You know? They, they, they know how to be humans and to live in the planet and to live with other people, and it's, it's all so, so, so natural. So I, I, I think we, you know, it's a, res a resource of knowledge that we should uh, remember more that is there. And also, I, I, I link this to something that Gary was saying, that you, you went to study psychology to, to learn about himself. And one, in one of these movies, there was a woman saying that she was, uh, uh, sh she went to university to learn about her own people. I think she was a Guarani indigenous. But of course, what she learned was about ancient Greece and, uh, and the Rome and all this. I mean, no one was able to teach uh, the history of her people. You know, so this is, uh, this is just a, a comment that some of your talks remind me of all these resources we have and that we are not using, you're not benefiting from them. Yeah. Thank you, Marta. Do you want to add anything? A very quick final comment for all of you. First of all, the more the local is involved with the university, the better. So your comment, uh, Igor, about locality is very well taken. And uh, Gary here has reinforced it. Number two, never underestimate what I call the perforated wall. The student, the perforated wall, where the student moves inside and outside university with equal ease. And we should have students whose full-time PhD, full-time master's, full-time bachelor's degree can be embedded in the, unit, in the local lo locality, working with business, working with government, working with civil society. Thirdly, we're going to be into a world where the so-called citizen assembly, citizens groups talking about how to better their future through these complicated mazes we've been hearing all afternoon, they need to be facilitated. And the ideal people for that are mixtures of students and citizens. And they, the combination is really helpful because the citizen informs the students and the students inform the citizens. And finally, we must always get back to the professions. We had a very interesting presentation on non-architecture. We need the same kind of thing in non-accountancy, the same kind of thing in non-law. In other words, opening up those professions into the kind of sustainability thinking which currently they close off because it doesn't suit their professional etiquette and their so-called certifications. That's another area that in our credentials for Intrepid we should be breaking down. So please see the university as a launching pad for the transfusion of ideas where the citizen and the business person and the local community is part of the university diaspora and the distinction between the student and the outside active agent becomes less and less relevant. Then you have a reason for being in university and then you have a reason for being able to be a citizen of the future. Uh, as a com final m remark, uh, in our discussion, I didn't want to give the impression that there's nothing we can do within the existing universities where most of you, I think, are situated. And I realize also in my own comments earlier that I, I was not exactly accurate, because actually I had one course in psychology that was really inspiring. And the interesting thing was it wasn't a course given for psychology majors. It was a course given for freshmen non-majors. And the professor in that course was so good 
that hundreds and hundreds of non-students would come into that course just to audit it because it was so relevant to them. And I think that with all the constraints that are there within the system, the right starting point is how much can we do to move to widen the walls. With all the limits on evaluation and curriculum and everything, there are ways to reverse it. There are ways to, uh, you mentioned non-accounting course. I was asked to give a lecture to MBA course students in finance, and I, I, uh, I saw if you ask them why their accounts did not reflect the reality of what happened to the company, they suddenly start thinking outside of the subject of accounting and see that this is not a real full measure of what a business is about. So to try to get out, I think all of you who are in teaching now in the university, there are ways to modify the pedagogy, to modify the perspective, to make it more contextual, and that's going to be the pressure from inside the system that will help create the bigger spaces that Tim is talking about for things to go through. I just want to suggest to do it together with the external world, right? the external world, the, 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 the labor market, uh, the local governments, the businesses, the NGOs, and with the students together. If you do that together, not only as um, academic staff, then you really make a point also for, you know, for the, the people in power who can make decisions to change the system. That is what I want to add. Okay, I really love this idea of broadening the institution going towards some kind of informal learning, right? Not education, but learning. That sounds much, 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 much better. Only just uh, a little, um, I think this should be goal oriented. The example that Marta made, very interesting example that Marta made of people in uh, South, uh, um, South America making movies, directing movies, not directors, but directing movies, it's is a form of self-expression. So you give people tools to make us know what, who they are and what they do. It's self-expression. It's not spreading, um, it, it's not educating someone else or activating further learning. It's activating knowledge in itself. When it comes to informal learning, it's a very interesting area. Uh, one of the most interesting thing I've done in my whole life was teaching technology, how to use the internet and digital uh, city digital services to elder people in a park on benches uh, in, in before, uh, before dinner time, you know. It was very, very interesting. But there uh, rises the, the question of quality. Uh, because in, if not, informal learning could become, I, uh, uh, everybody can teach anything and uh, in the end, you have people who teach something and they basically graduated at the Facebook University of Life, which will not increase the quality of anybody's life at the end. So uh, when it's self-expression, it's one thing. There's another beautiful example of uh, miners in a, um, uh, working in a, uh, in, a mine in China who were taught how to make portraits. And they did, some years ago, great photographs. They photographed each other. It, it was, there was a, a great exhibition, black and white portraits, great. But when it comes to teaching or to spreading knowledge, I think the quality uh, must not be put at risk. That's my conclusion. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but but we we have I, I've been involved in in uh, what was called initiative for university for the future um, uh, a couple of years ago and this was a very interesting process and we had long discussions about this quality assurance and somehow I always felt uncomfortable with it because in a way and many of these um, outside the university learning institutions which are successful mm -hmm. They are successful because of the people who have gone through this and apply what they have learned successfully somewhere. So they are growing a reputation, which is the quality assurance. 
You know, so if this is applicable, what I mentioned earlier is with the engineering colleges I have seen in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, they have a degree, they are also recognized um, uh, colleges, but they don't produce quality, even though there is some assurance, but it's so mechanistic that it's besides the point. So they, the accreditation is basically useless and they don't find jobs even though they come from recognized engineering colleges. So they need, you know, so <laughs> we are back to this point of certification. And so I wish us luck. <laughs> so thank you very much to all of you, to the four of you, of course, to all of you. With this, we end up this uh, panel discussion. I know that there are many questions, that there are many comments pending, but we can follow the conversation afterwards. So thank you very much. Well, who am I? I was about to fall. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for staying, participating. Igor, you work great, and I gave you a terrible responsibility. <laughs> but you lived up to it, of course. And thank you for the panelists and the speakers for staying with us for the whole afternoon. And, and thank you all. Um, and I want Marta to come up and appear. Because otherwise, people will begin to think that there is only one person in Intrepid, and there's at least two, plus everybody else. So, so, um, so thank you, thank you all for staying with us, to, for closing our four-year adventure. Um, we still have drinks, that's the good news for those, those who resisted. So we can still ask each other questions over wine and some drinks. Uh, but I really want to thank you, I want to thank again Jacob for doing all this marvelous work. Thank you. Um, and David for recording us for over four days. Thankfully, he said it wasn't too boring. That's very, that was great. So thank you. I want to thank Monica, who is standing there very quiet, because I know she's done everything for us. Uh, and now this is, uh, as you, some of you know, uh, Olivia and me for four years probably, and uh, and this has uh, this has been a, a, what we like to say a journey. <laughs> I never used this word before these four years, so I think now I can use it. And it has been really uh, uh, very for me intrepid. You know, I, I got tired of inter and transdisciplinary very fast. To be honest, these discussions that lead to nowhere. And uh, <laughs> so, but then we we of course. Uh, it's, this is a small detail because there is so much to learn uh, through all of you and uh, for me to learn personally by ha dealing with all of you and with all the coordination and also mainly, I mean, to, uh, to deal with Olivia and Olivia to deal with me because it was, we are such two different uh, people, you know. Uh, we are very good friends before, but uh, I think we were... Uh, we, we had sometimes moments that we were, I have an experience of divorce already, so I think we were very close to it at, uh, at some given points. True. It's true, she knows. But now, I mean, all these uh, four years, really we are uh, as better friends than we were before, I think, because this is, <laughs> this uh, kind of, we learned a lot, the two of us, during this, uh, during this process. And I think this, I'm sure we'll be working not about inter and transdisciplinary, but we'll be working about something else in the in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.